Wise Child by Monica Furlong Chapter 15 The Feast of Bialtana Apart from the night when I flew, I had never seen the mainland in my life until Juniper and I went to the Feast of Bialtana. Setting off early in the morning, we walked through the silent village with Tilly clopping between us, our clothes and food in baskets on her back. We sailed across to the mainland in a Berlin, a galley with a bottle of holy water tied to her prow. Then we walked for miles through the hilly countryside until we left Dalriada behind. Exhausted from struggling across bogs and hillsides, we stayed with the Laird of Ferkeld, introduced to me by Juniper as the Green Doran. Then, leaving faithful Tilly in the Laird's stable, we set off again on some fine fresh horses, including a little roan pony for me. We stayed at Twill on, in the island home of the anchoress of Twill, a Christian who also had the title of the Grey Doran. Finally, at the head of the Great Glen, we turned west and then north. Three days after Juniper and I had left the island, we and two other Dorans arrived at an inn at the edge of the sea where the innkeeper and his wife greeted us as old friends. Tomorrow, Juniper said to me, we arrive. We stayed late in bed the next day, dawdled by the fire, talking and eating. Why don't we go, I wondered, bored by the grown-up conversations. We go at dusk, said Juniper. It seemed a very long, dull day to me. Several times I wandered out of doors, went down to the small, clean beach where a number of boats were drawn up, threw stones into the water so that they would bounce off of the surface and looked across the long stretch of water to where I could dimly see islands in the distance. I had a feeling that puzzled me, a familiarity. As the bright afternoon began to fade, Juniper called to me. On the bed of our room at the inn, she had laid out the beautiful green dress with its velvet cloak. There was hot water in a tub on the floor and Juniper stood by the window, weaving a garland of spring flowers. My heart gave a tiny leap inside of me, of excitement, of fear, of a recognition that was beyond me to explain. With Juniper's help, I bathed myself in the scented water. She dried me with a warm, rough towel, and then, very gently, slid the beautiful dress over my head, my skin shivered at the liquid touch of silk. She fastened the broad girdle around my waist, combed my wet hair, and sat me down to wait while she too bathed herself. She put on a deep red dress that seemed to bring flames up into her cheeks and bound up her dark hair with a silver comb. I felt in awe of her, as if I did not know her at all, she was so splendid. This did not seem to be the juniper whom I knew day by day, at whose table I ate, and in whose rooms I slept. I lowered my eyes. Soon my hair dried in the heat of the fire, and juniper brushed and combed it. Then she took the garland and carefully placed it on my head. Come and look at yourself. I looked timidly. I was pale but unmistakably pretty. My hair, which had once looked so dreadful, rippled blackly in the mirror under its tiny flower crown. The dress was the finest I had ever seen, let alone worn. My eyes traveled in the mirror to Juniper, who smiled at me. Meet the Red Doran, she said in one of her important undertones. Thought you'd better know now. She bent and kissed me, fastening the velvet cloak around my shoulders with a clasp of green stones that looked like bright moss. We were ready to go. The other members of the party were equally splendid. 
the laird in a green mantle with an animal brooch at his shoulder, and his shoes with silver buckles, the anchoress in a grey gown the colour of mist, with her white hair beautifully dressed, the innkeeper also in mantle and brooch, with his wife wearing a golden torque and a snake armlet. The ship sailed gently across to the island, its white path and trees gradually becoming clearer in the evening light, the western sun giving it an extraordinary radiance. It grew dark and a little chilly, and I was glad of my warm cloak, which felt rich and splendid around my neck. We sailed on and on. My eyes were drawn to the phosphorescent glow of the waves. Juniper came to talk to me as I stood looking out at, at the prow of the ship. I will not be with you during the ceremony, Juniper said, but don't be anxious. You will find that you know what to do, and whatever happens and however strange it feels, have no fear. This is a night to be glad about. I shivered a little at her words, though I didn't feel afraid exactly. I felt excited, as though anything might happen, as though the wise child who left the island the next day might be a different wise child from the one who approached it. There were many people at the little jetty where we got off the boat, all entirely silent. Juniper made her way through the crowd and disappeared. Everyone was moving slowly in the same direction. There were a number of young girls dressed like me, and there were older girls and boys dressed in white linen tunics and carrying torches, which they lit from a brazier behind the jetty. Slowly the older girls and boys moved in twos, up the winding path ahead of us, and the younger children, myself among them, followed behind. It was very dark now, and far ahead of us I could see the torches glimmering like fireflies. My sense of smell seemed unusually strong. I believed I could smell wild garlic and mint in the woods on each side of us, or maybe we were crushing it beneath our feet. As we walked, calm, unhurried, I began to hear the sound of a drum far away, solemn, slow, measured. Then came the husky, unearthly notes of a flute. It did not play a tune so much as ask a question, the question that this evening was putting to me. The path wound upward, became steep and tiring, and then it wound down again. From far ahead of us, where the torches were bravely burning, came the sound of singing. The singers took up the question of the flute. The path was descending sharply now, past a rushing waterfall on our right, around a curve that made the voices of the singers faint and the light of the torches disappear. Though the the thump of the drum seemed now to throb right through us. I noticed that we all walked in time to it. As we rounded the curve, we found ourselves at the foot of an avenue of huge stones. And it was then, of course, that I knew where we were. I had come back to the place I had visited in my flying vision, the place that Juniper had said would be important for me. I felt very small and solemn in my fine clothes walking up that great avenue just as I had done before. As before, I came to the big outer circle of stones. Only this time there were several hundred people grouped among the stones, and near the middle of the circle were the dying embers of a fire. The singing died away, and all of us stood there in silence. We were, it seemed to me, waiting for something. I could see people moving far away on the other side of the circle, and out of the dark emerged twelve figures in gold. Each wore a huge embroidered gold cloak, each wore a crown, 
and each wore a strangely wrought mask. I know now that they were masks, but my first thought was that these were gods or supernatural figures. They were preternaturally tall. They appeared to glide over the ground, and the expressions on their faces. Their faces made my heart stand still and my knees turn to water. Their faces expressed joy, anger, laughter, grief. One mask was so cruelly ferocious that suddenly I wanted Juniper very badly, or else I wanted to get out of this strange place. So frightened was I that I had a sensation as if I was falling through space, lost forever. But then, like a ledge presenting itself, or a plant embedded on a rocky cliff that I could cling to, I heard the words that I knew as well as I knew myself. Aringi Glarm Karun. Automatically I joined in the familiar string of words, and my swift descent into nothingness was arrested. All of us were half saying, half chanting, those extraordinary words whose meaning I did not understand. I noticed that now the girls in white were moving among the people bearing chalices of silver from which every person took a sip. I bent my head like the others and took my mouthful, a stony mineral taste as if earth was mixed with the water. I wanted to spit it out, but I didn't dare. Almost at once I became aware of something that I did not want to know. I knew that the king or lord of those gods in the center, the one with the oldest and wisest face, was going to summon me, and that I would not be able to move, that I would be rooted to the spot. The liquid I had drunk was running in my veins like fire. I began to sweat furiously, and to feel as if all of me had climbed up into my head into the tiny space behind my eyes. I was walking toward that center space as if my legs knew something I did not. In the middle of the stone circles was a flat stone, a rectangle, of which the narrow end was facing toward me. At the other end of this stone stood the oldest and wisest figure, who looked both stern and loving, fierce and gentle, innocent and wise. In his hand was a dagger. I see, I thought. He is going to kill me. I was not angry, nor especially frightened anymore, but I was puzzled. Why should I be killed? And why should Juniper, whom I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt to love me, allow it to happen to me? And where was Juniper? I stood still at the end of the altar stone, trying to look straight and dignified, and as I did so, the chanting died away. The words were nowhere near finished yet, so I wondered why they had stopped. Once again, I felt that they were all waiting, only this time I slowly realized that they were waiting for me. I groped in the back of my mind for those familiar words and I almost jumped when I heard my high voice, with a tiny tremor in it, actually begin to recite them out loud. I continued alone for a verse or two, and then, with the emphasis of thunder, the whole company came in with a sort of refrain. Once again, after a little, they stopped, and I continued alone. Once again, they joined in. It sounded like question and answer. I realized that the crowd on the right of the altar had parted, and through the middle of it, both hesitant and yet as inevitably as I had moved myself, there walked a deer, exquisitely graceful, his great antlers held proudly, his face looking from side to side, as if to see everyone who was there. The deer stood beside me, looking up into my face, and upon its antlers one of the god figures placed a tiny golden crown. The singing continued, 
and to my surprise I began to know what the language was about. Not just the part we were singing now, but the whole poem. It began with the praise and joy in all creation, copying the voice of the wind and the sea. It described sun and moon, stars and clouds, birth and death, winter and spring, the essence of fish, bird, animal, and man. It spoke in what seemed to be the language of each creature. I remembered Ruby joining in on the night I had finally mastered the poem. It spoke of well, spring, and stream, of the seed that comes from the loins of a male creature and of the embryo that grows in the womb of the female. It pictured the dry seed deep in the dark earth, feeling the rain and the warmth seeping down to it. It sang of the green shoot and of the tawny heads of harvest grain standing out in the field under the great moon. It described the chrysalis that turns into a golden butterfly, the eggs that break to let out the fluffy bird life within, the birth pangs of woman and of beast. It went on to speak of the dark ferocity of the creatures that pounce upon their prey and plunge their teeth into it. It spoke in the muffled voice of bear and wolf. It sang the songs of the great hawks and eagles and owls until their wild faces seemed to be staring into mine. And I knew myself as wild as they. It sang the minor chords of pain and sickness of injury and old age. For a few moments I felt I was an old woman, with age heavy upon me. Again the music stopped. There was silence for a long time. Then, from far away on the mountain behind, I could hear a boy's voice of intolerable purity, crystal pure as an echo. Why, why, why? his voice asked. As if in answer, the deer moved forward, raised his head to stare straight at the chief of the gods, who in turn lifted his silver dagger. For a moment there was a line of ruby along the deer's beautiful neck, and then the creature dropped like a stone upon the turf, the bright light gradually leaving its big luminous eyes. I gasped, though not in horror. We were in a place beyond horror, where everything was understood in its true light. The deer had come in response to our singing, and had offered himself in response to our question. He was the answer to it. There was another long moment of silence, and then the singing began again, very quietly, mournfully, yet hopefully. During this part, I began to look more attentively at the gods in the circle, and with a little shock of recognition that actually made me jump, I became convinced that one of them was Juniper. Quite how I knew, I am unsure. Certainly, dark eyes glittered behind her mask, but others in that circle had dark eyes, too. I just knew that it was she, as if I could smell her, I moved toward her and stood beside her. Her arm went around me, and at that moment I caught a glimpse of a crimson dress beneath her great golden cloak. The great solemnity of the occasion began to give way to rapturous joy. A bonfire was lit, the sacrificial deer was cooked on it, and all of us partook of its sacred flesh. We ate many rich kinds of food, we drank wine, we danced. Juniper threw off her cloak and mask and was again resplendent in her crimson dress. We sailed back across the water as the sun was rising the next morning, a delicate primrose of a sun in a pale green sky. I leaned against Juniper, too tired for speech. When we got back to the inn, Juniper helped me undress lifting my heavy arms, raising me to the lap of the bed, 
tucking me in, kissing me. I was asleep before she had drawn the curtains on the rising day.